All right. Here we are today, April 29th, 2020. Happy birthday to Juanis. I'm sure he'll be listening at some point in time, but happy birthday, Juanito. Um, so let's just do a recap of last week and let's do a recap of the homework assignment. We stepped into the public victories last week. Remember, habits one, two, three were the private victories. Now we're stepping into the public victories. And last week was, you know, think win-win, you know, and what a, what a game changer that's going to be, you know, the more you keep practicing that, always putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, always looking to find ways that they can win and you can win. I mean, a win-win paradigm should really be in every relationship you have. Like, I would love to hear the argument on, no, there are some situations that need to be win-lose. There are some situations that need to be, you know, just win. I mean, if I know in, in a competing business like we're in, we throw contests, we throw bonuses. A lot of times one person wins and everybody loses. Are there things we can do, however, where there's incentive and things where a team of people can win, everybody can win in a scenario. Those are the, those are the challenges I think we should all have uh, in thinking win-win in a somewhat of a win-lose world that we were all kind of raised in. So the homework assignment for you, other than reading habit five, was, you know, what areas in your life are lacking win-win? I use an example last week of like, hey, dealing with your landlord, asking for free rent. I mean, you can't just walk in saying, give me free rent. That's think win. Are you thinking win-win? Are you presenting it win-win to your landlord? That was somewhat of an example that I gave for that. You know, and, and how can you improve on those relationships? You know, like what relationships are lacking win-win? How can you improve? That was the homework assignment. All right, so then habit five, okay? Seek first to understand, then to be understood. I mean, just that kind of sums it up right there. I mean, just that sentence, you know, seek first to understand, then to be understood. You know, so as I've had a week to prepare for this and just go through, you know, just different stories and stuff like that. You know, I remember years ago, uh, back when John Wooden was alive, I think I've refer referenced him a couple times on these calls. You know, uh, the Wizard of Westwood, if you haven't read any of his stuff, he's got so much great stuff to study. Um, Ken was telling me that a gift for one of his sons um, was a meeting with John Wooden. I'm like, whoa, you know, like, what a cool dad you are. Like, you set up a one-on-one -on -one with your, your son and John Wooden, the Wizard of Westwood. And uh, I believe Ken accompanied his son. I'm not sure which one of his sons was in on that meeting. And so I was curious. I, I knew uh, when the meeting was, and I was looking forward to talking to Ken after. And I said to Ken, I'm like, so, so what did you learn? How was that one-on-one? -on -one? I mean, I've, he's one of those guys I've been intrigued with my whole life. And um, he said, you know, Wooden said that the greatest skill of a leader is the ability to listen. Leaders are listeners. I was shocked to hear that. I mean, I, I didn't expect that to be like the number one attribute of a leader is, you know, these suckers right here, you know, the ears. Um, but then again, maybe I shouldn't be so surprised. I mean, if you read Carnegie's book, right, How to Win Friends and Influence People, you know, in his recruitment, I mean, he was known 100 years ago to, like, he developed millionaires 100 years ago. He had this uncanny track record of creating success. And he's like, you know, I don't look for people with great mouths. There are a dime a dozen. I can find anybody with a great mouth. I want to find somebody with great ears. He said the best salespeople in the world are the ones that have great ears, not the ones that have great mouths somewhat of a misconception to believe that the, you know, the best salespeople, you know, are these, you know, gift of the gab. They're not gift of the gab. They are gifted with, with good ears. So I want to start off. I've got, I've got a handful of videos for you guys. Today's not just one long video. I've got four videos to share with you. 
Um, this first one's a funny one. You can go uh, right to franklincovey.com. Uh, they've got so many great, again, that's where all the training classes are. That's where you, you can go on to Franklin Covey, find out courses that they have on all these habits, and they're more than happy to train you, and it's well worth the money. I'm, I'm endorsing them big time. Uh, been to many of them, and I love them. So this is straight from their site, and it's just a quick little video, and it's a little cheeky. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, let's see what we got here. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop they... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. Yeah, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail. See, you're out. not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just. Sometimes it's like. There's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just... Don't! There you are. You like that? It's cute, huh? Her, her sweaters are getting all these snags. <laughs> I'm like, I like that part. My sweaters are getting, yeah, I mean, there's the challenge, right? There's the challenge. You know, we just want to go in and fix. We don't want to listen. And listening is oxygen. Uh, so I'm going to show another video here soon, but um, the third video you're gonna hear this from Stephen Covey. Okay, you're gonna hear this from, from Stephen. He said, you study, you study every field of human endeavor. You study every problem solving process in every profession without an exception. And this is kind of one of these duh moments, but like, again, I, I think it's interesting. He says, you'll always find that to understands precedes action. And again, you could say, well, duh. Again, any problem solving situation, any human endeavor, he says, without exception, you'll always find that understanding precedes action. To understand precedes judgment. Yet how quick are we to act? How quick are we to judge without truly understanding? I mean, that's, I guess that's the challenge. This is right from the book. Again, you guys read, uh, you know, Habit 5. He says, we have such a tendency to rush in to fix things, like the dude talking to his friend with the nail, um, to fix things with good advice. But we often fail to take the time to diagnose, to really deeply understand the problem first. Seek first to understand, then to be understood is the key to effective interpersonal communication. John Maxwell and his trainings, I remember him saying this years ago, uh, he wrote a book, The 25 Ways of Winning with People, I think is what it's called. And I think the very beginning of that book, he says, communication is the most important skill to learn in life. You can learn a lot of skills. I mean, you can learn to be a surgeon and get some crazy skills. You can learn, you know, a million different skills. He, he makes an argument to say the most important is communication skills. Nothing you will ever gain will be more important than those skills to be used in every aspect of your life. Again, back to the book, we spend, this is a good call out, we spend most of our waking hours communicating, but consider this, you've spent years learning how to read and write. 
I went through some of my old report cards with my kids recently, you know, and my son's in the fourth grade. So I'm going through my fourth grade report card. I'm comparing mine to his and what some of our teachers said. I mean, reading was on that report card. Writing was on that report card. For years, I was graded on reading and writing and I'm preaching to the choir. I mean, so were you. So we've spent many years, many hours being trained in those two departments. We've also been uh, trained in how to speak. You know, some of, I went to a, confer, a, a course called Rock the Room. All the consultants and I went to this little thing called Rock the Room, teaching us how to speak. It was intriguing, very intriguing. This, this, this uh, woman running the course, she was such a, a great storyteller. It was unbelievable. And like, here's some skills you can practice to be a great presenter, be a great speaker. Okay, so we're trained in reading, writing, and speaking. But what about listening? Just a quick show of hands. How many of you guys have been trained? You took a class, took a course on how to listen. I don't, oh, I see one hand. Interesting. Interesting, right? Uh, what training or education have you had that enables you to listen so that you really deeply understand another human being from that individual's own frame of reference. I mean, the reality is we just have not been trained on how to listen. So next video I'm gonna show you here, five levels of listening, okay? The five levels of listening that we all go through. We'll go through this stuff here shortly together, but these are gonna be quick videos. So I've got four videos total, they're all fairly quick. So this is gonna be our second video I'm gonna share. Let me describe five levels of listening itself. You might say it's a continuum of listening. The lowest level is to not listen at all. We could almost use the word you ignore somebody. You're not even there hardly at all. You're just into your own world or whatever. The second level is you pretend to listen. You may learn the body language and give the you know, even the mimicking responses of the last person's sentence. The third level is to listen selectively. You are really hearing. Oh yeah, that, that, that reminds me. <laughs> let, let me share. Oh, I agree with that, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, what you said back there, I know exactly what you mean. I've had the same kind of experience. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I mean, see, you did understand. But your mind is so into your own hot buttons that you're listening always in terms of those buttons and those interests. But you did understand. The fourth level is to listen attentively. You're really giving full attention out of real sincerity. That takes a lot of energy, really to attend to another. But still, you're into your head. The fifth is to listen empathically, to leave your head, to get into their head and their heart. Not that you are trying to sympathize or agree or disagree. You take no position at all. Remember how we have used the iceberg as a kind of uh, metaphor? Well, it really pertains to the subject of empathy and communication. We talked about the tip being just the technique. You know what the great mass of the iceberg is? The motive. The deeper attitude. Are you really anxious to understand? Now, the magic really comes from the human affirmation process. If we were to suck the air out of this room right now, what would happen to our interest? <laughs> now that we have air, does air motivate us? What is it that motivates us? The absence of air. The psychological equivalent of air is to feel understood. It is the deepest hunger of the human heart. 
But to give someone psychological air, it makes it almost impossible for someone to fight you. It so feeds a person's spirit. It so nourishes and nurtures that they become open, non-defensive. One time, a father said, I don't understand my boy. He won't listen to me at all. I said, you don't understand your boy because he won't listen to you. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Let me restate again what I heard exactly you saying. You don't understand your boy because he won't listen to you. And that's really frustrating. Yeah, I mean, you don't understand you. Why do you keep repeating it? I thought to understand another, you needed to listen to them. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, I understand my boy, I understand him. I mean, I've been there, I know exactly what he's talking about. He hasn't the foggiest, no one's ever been there. Everyone's life is so singular, so unique. Who's going to listen to that uniqueness? That's pretty powerful. Nobody's ever been there, you know, that uniqueness. Oh, yeah, I've been there before. I mean, boy, how many of us, after you train a bunch of people, right, and you kind of been there, done that, yeah, I know the, I know the ropes. Um, a lot of times we don't want to listen because we feel like we've been there. But he's saying, yeah, listen, nobody has been there. I mean, that's interesting to hear that. Uh, a couple big powerful things came out of that video. I, I just want to repeat this. I mean, some of you are probably, you know, trying to write it down, but the psychological equivalent of error, that was a powerful statement. The psychological equivalent of error is to feel understood. Like the girl with the nail, like, thank you. You listen to me. It's the deepest hunger of the human heart. Now, those are really powerful statements. Back to the book. And again, I'm, I'm ripping through the book. I'm highlighting things. Seek First to Understand involves a very deep shift in paradigm. We typically seek first to be understood. Most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. They're either speaking or preparing to speak. They're filtering everything through their own paradigms, reading their autobiography into other people's lives. Again, powerful stuff. When another person speaks, we're usually listening at one of four levels. Okay, we covered this. Ignoring, okay, not really listening at all. Uh, we may practice pretending, the second one. Yeah, uh-huh, right. We may practice selective listening, hearing only certain parts of the conversation. We often do this when we're listening to constant chatter of a preschool child, is how Stephen Covey writes in the book. Or we may even practice attentive listening, pay attention and focusing energy on the words that are being said. But very few of us ever practice the fifth level, the highest form of listening, empathic listening. When I say empathic listening, I mean listening with the intent to understand. I mean seeking first to understand, to really understand. It is an entirely different paradigm. Uh, empathy or empathic listening gets inside another person's frame of reference. You look out through it. You see the world the way they see the world. You understand their paradigm. You understand how they feel. Again, deep stuff. I'll get, I want to show another video. We'll get into some more of this. Another video. study every field of human endeavor, you study every problem-solving process in every profession, 
without an exception. And you'll always find... You know the answer. To understand precedes action. To understand precedes judgment. Lawyers go through a discovery process, often even prepare the case for the opposing counsel. Doctors diagnose before they prescribe. Teachers pre-assess before they teach. What does the amateur salesperson do? Sells products. What does the professional salesperson do? Sells solutions. It's habit five. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. The tendency in almost all people initially is to want to be understood. Or if they do seek to understand, they seek with the intent to reply, with the intent to in some way influence, to some way bring the person about, to accomplish their own end, not with the intent to understand. Now, what's your first name? Hal. Hal? Why does Hal wear those glasses? I don't see better. Okay, but what did the optometrist do before he prescribed? He diagnosed. The optometrist tried to understand. The optometrist was first influenced before attempting to influence. And that helped in the diagnosis and the prescription. And that is why Hal wears these glasses. Can I borrow your glasses for a second? You'll love these. <laughs> these will really change your paradigm. These are, <laughs> these are more powerful? <laughs> My friend, you've liked these, haven't you? For a long time. For a long time. We're sure they'll help you. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> My friend. What's your first name? Anna. Anna? Try harder. <laughs> I mean, really give those lenses the college try. That help you now? No. <laughs> no. Think positively. I mean, there's nothing wrong, Anna, with this program that a good positive attitude can't correct. Getting dizzy. <laughs> Getting dizzy? This is the company way, Anna. <laughs> How current your resume. <laughs> you like them now? No. <laughs> they look good on you, Anna. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> See, we all feel they look good on you. <laughs> Anna. Daughter, your mother and I, for many years, have distilled the wisdom of our life for your benefit. That's intergenerational wisdom, too, Anna. <laughs> We've learned it from before. And we put them in the form of those lenses. We've done our best. Anna, you like them now? They're great, but I still can't see. <laughs> <laughs> They're great, but I can't see. That's kind of a double message, Anna. I mean, do you have any idea the kinds of sacrifices that your mother and I have made for you? <laughs> The things we have done for your benefit? Huh? In fact, you know what your mother even did to bring you into the world? <laughs> and the efforts we're making to give to you every opportunity? I mean, it's interesting, right? The crowd's laughing, but I mean, how many of us can relate to this? I mean, everybody can. It's like, it's clear he's not listening. What more do we have to say to you, Anna? Like them now. No. <laughs> <laughs>
she's got some integrity. <laughs> usually people capitulate. <laughs> but usually I don't give them that strong of a lens. <laughs> <laughs> when they capitulate, I then move to the next person. <laughs> How do you like them? I like them. <laughs> okay, then you have to learn the rest of the day. That's right. For the, all those who are quick studies, they are rewarded. You can wear them the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> are those tears of gratitude? <laughs> there you are, my friend. You can oh, see again. Thank you. <laughs> I could feel your anxiety level. <laughs> now, when I'm convinced I'm right, when you're convinced you're right, do we really want other people's opinions? How many of us, when we are in that mental state, use those methods? You may not use the more extreme ones. You may just simply use the more common ones. Try harder. Just think positively. It'll make the difference. What's so scary is if you don't use those methods and you let somebody talk, seek first to understand, you might have your mind changed. And a lot of us don't want our mind changed. We want to stand at the same path that we feel comfortable with. It's very interesting what he just said. If we really start listening, you may be influenced, particularly if our security lies in being right. If you really seek to understand, you run the risk. You're vulnerable. Can you begin to get a better understanding as to why we have the private victory of one, two, and three? Why? So you can have the self-confidence. Okay, the confidence, your security, security comes from integrity to principles, not from being right. So you could be the first person to say, I was wrong. You learn real fast. But almost everyone is anxious to prescribe glasses for eyes they have not diagnosed because if they really engage in a meaningful dialogue with me, they become vulnerable themselves. It exposes sometimes their own center, their own need to be right, their own need to give wise counsel, to shape up this son, this daughter, this employee, even this customer. <laughs> you don't know what you need. We know what you need. We'll tell you. Hey, you know, I can't help but think of, um, you know, we're watching, and for those of you watching TV, I'm, I'm sure you're all plugged into news one way or another. You're plugged into the news. You know, and it's like, if both sides can listen, let's just talk coronavirus sides, because there's two big opposing issues happening right now. One is a very much everybody's got to quarantine, everybody's got to stay at home, let's squash this virus. You've got an opposing view where you're hearing, hey, the, the cure can't be more costly than the disease and we got to get the economy ramped up again, we got to get busy, and why are we quarantining healthy people? You're hearing both of these. Somehow, if you're a politician, don't you have to listen to both sides? Because it's interesting, because I'll listen to some people that are very much one way it almost reminds me of like somebody who's totally liberal will just talk from a liberal podium and somebody totally republican would stand in another podium but if the two could just listen to each other i mean you'll hear this in the next habit as well too the law of synergy or sorry maxwell will call it the law but the synergize is habit six if somebody as smart as you you're smart and you have an opposing point of view, well, then I should be intelligent enough to listen to you and seek where you're coming from. So if you've got two really smart people on opposing platforms, and a lot of times, again, the gong show that we see the politicians do, I mean, I'm almost embarrassed to show my kids anything on the news with politics because they're so mean to each other and they're not kind and 
And it's almost like they just don't have ears to hear. And so I would just say, you know, we're kind of watching this thing play out. Like, listen, you got to really seek to understand. Again, we're going to hear that in synergy. But if somebody who's opposing my point of view, and I respect you, and you're smart, you're intelligent, I have to listen. I have to listen. You know, I, you know, it's funny, this, again, this habit, uh, you know, I, I think I told you guys last week, like, this isn't my strongest habit. First time I took this course, I was, uh, you know, a newlywed for the most part. Uh, it was back in 03, 04 that I think I took this course. And I was telling my wife, you know, habit five, I said, I, I think this is the one that I, I probably struggle with the most, you know, seek first to understand then to be understood. She says, yeah. She says, well, if you had to write the book, you would say seek first to be understood. And then if time permits, maybe you'll have the chance to understand. I'm like, really? <laughs> like, that's what it's like being married to me. She goes, oh yeah. I mean, you just, you know, and so here again, like, listen to this. This is what Stephen Covey just said in this last video. When we're convinced that we're right, do we really want other people's opinions? Again, just think the politicians. I mean, this they're all guilty of this is what it seems like. I know they're not all, but man, when you're convinced you're right, you don't even want to hear what anybody else has to say. He says, we listen with the intent to reply. We listen with the intent to influence. We listen with the intent to accomplish our own agenda. So sure, it's easier to look at the politicians and say, this is what they do, but how about you? You know, so I've been, you know, I'm happy to say my wife would say today, I've been, I've been improving in this department, but I've made a conscious effort to, to really improve in this department. I mean, I read a lot and listen to a lot of um, books on EQ, emotional quotient. You know, how do other people feel around me? It's one thing to have high IQ, if you have low EQ, you are going to struggle as a leader. I think that's a muscle we could all build. And part of good EQ, emotional quotient, is empathy, you know, how others feel around you. Again, your ability to listen might have something to do with that. Um, okay, so my last video, yeah, this is video four. I'm going to show you guys a video of what empathic listening looks like. Okay, let's talk about empathic listening. Five phases of learning empathic responses. Okay, this is good stuff here. Okay, let's do a little review of this concept of empathy. And let me describe the five phases of learning empathic responses. Mimicking, paraphrasing or rephrasing, okay? You say their words, their meaning in new words. There's the faithful translation on content. The third, reflect feeling. It's hurting, it's pain, frustrating, happy, relieved. See, just you're listening with the eyes and the heart. You're listening to body language. Your, your head is in where that person is. Fourth, rephrase content and reflect feeling. It's relieving to at last find out where you are on these tests in reading or whatever, see. And the fifth is to kind of just say nothing. You're just with the person and they can sense it. And you do that when you feel confident that they feel understood and that they know you understand. That's all part of habit five. To seek first to understand is to get an education. To seek first to understand is to do surveys with customers. To seek first to understand is to empathically be a faithful translator to another. To seek first to understand is to 
never even having related to another person, to know there are certain generic needs in all people. That which is most personal is most general. Therefore, there's a certain civility, a certain courtesy, a certain basic kindness, a certain basic treatment that apply across the board, that basically tap into those universal principles we have spoken about before. And the last half of Habit 5 is just the concept of then to be understood, then judge, then act, then go into problem solving. Now, test this, my friends. Test the power of this. Next time you get into a difficult situation, just say to yourself, the end in mind I have is not my way. Instead, it's a better way that has not yet been discovered. I'm going to just empathize. I would like to have this opportunity. Whether that really logically comes out of it, I don't know. I remember one situation. I had taught habits four, five, and six. And then I said, tonight, practice it. In some situation. And tomorrow morning, report back on your experience. The person came in, I cannot believe what happened last night. It was a real estate situation. He said, I've been working on this commercial real estate situation for eight months. All my eggs were in one basket. I had no income. I was very dependent upon this situation. I was so vulnerable, so desperate. And I'd been doing everything I could to finesse, to make it look like it would be win-win, but one way or another, I was going to win that deal. Last night, we went to a hotel room with the party that we're trying to deal with, and he had his attorney there, his accountant, and there was another real estate person brought in. And he said, my heart sunk. And he could see the handwriting on the wall. It wasn't going to go in his direction. And then he said, I'm going to lose this. Why not try what a teacher taught me today? He said, if I'm going to lose it anyway, why not try it? And he said to the person, he had to really kind of breathe deep and be prepared. I may lose it, but I'm going to try it. Let me see if I understand what it is you really want and what your most fundamental concerns and needs are. I hear you saying, correct me if I'm wrong. And they, he started to put it forth. The other person said yes, and then, and he just stayed with, listening from within the frame of reference of the other. He started to listen fully. He learned some things he had not learned before. He didn't rush in. He had enough discipline and patience to not rush in with his good solutions and based on his past mentored formula of success. He listened. He was open. He started coming forth more and more. He started to learn. He persisted for no more than about 15, 20 minutes. The man said, would you excuse me for a moment? He went to the other side of the room, picked up the phone, called his wife, turned back and said, you've got the deal. This guy was aghast. He said, I had no idea what happened. I tried to explain. Far more important than the technical elements of the deal was the quality of the relationship. That's the power of it. Phases of, empath of learning empathic responses. Hope you guys got that because we're going to role play here shortly. It's me and somebody. Um, mimicking. That's funny, mimicking. Tony Robbins. I, I find so many of these courses all blend together, whether it's Maxwell, Ken Blanchard, 
Tony Robbins. I remember going to a course with Tony Robbins and he's like, he's like, try this out. You're, you're sitting at a booth at a restaurant and somebody else is sitting at a booth. Try mimicking what the other person's doing. Like just start, you know, if they're bouncing their leg, you start bouncing their leg. Like he goes through all this interesting psychology. Um, and again, real interesting. You can eventually, what he's saying is you can start to feel what the other person is feeling if you're mimicking their physical uh, traits. I mean, I'll, I'll give you another exercise. I've done this as a morning meeting. This is interesting. Three people, right? You put you got person A, B, and C, groups of three. This is a Tony Robbins Unleash the Power Within. Go to, it's a four-day seminar. Go to the seminar, spend the money, well worth the money. They'll break you up several times over. A, B, C. Person A, think of a time in your life that's just really emotional. Could be a real positive emotion or you won the big championship or something like that. Could be real negative emotion. You know, you lost a loved one or something like that. So think of that moment in your life, okay? Person B, your job is to do the same physical things that you see person A doing. If their eyebrows are scrunched down, your eyebrows are scrunched down. If they're, you know, rubbing their hands at this speed, you rub your hands at this speed. And person C, you just keep correcting person B. No, squint harder. Jamie, squint harder. Oh, okay. Squint harder. Rub your hands faster. Okay, got it. You guys get the picture? A, B, and C. Do this for a couple minutes. And person C is, again, correcting. Person A's got the easy job. You're just closing your eyes, thinking of that memory in your mind. Person B, you got the hard job. You're supposed to do what they're doing. And person C, you're just correcting B to just get it fully aligned. Exercise is done. Okay, person B, explain what happened. Every time I did this, and you could hear in a big Tony Robbins crowd of maybe, I don't know, thousands of people go to this thing. Everybody's like, <gasps> like, couldn't believe it. Person B would describe what happened every time. Well, I, I feel like I lost, I feel like I lost the love. But yes, I, and person A would say, yes, that's what happened. And, and it was the time of my life when blank. It was amazing. I mean, so the power of mimicking, again, I'm, I'm giving you a little Tony Robbins add on to what he just said there. It is powerful. I mean, my, my daughter, I mean, geez, my daughter, when she was four, I couldn't believe this. We're talking about animals in the house. Okay, we're talking about animals. And um, somehow the topic comes up, my first animal. Okay, first animal. And then, you know, talk, she asks, you know, and, and did he die, Dad? I'm like, yeah, my dog died. And I, he died around four, you know, and you know, you're four. And she's asking me these questions. My daughter, my four-year-old is asking me these questions. She's looking at me as I'm talking, and she's got this pouty look on her face, and her eyes start to water, and then I started to cry. I couldn't believe it. I said to my wife, I'm like, I, I can't believe how gifted this little girl is. And maybe this is a girl thing or something. I don't know, but most people can't make me cry, you know, like. I was blown away whether, you know, she was just attentive, you know, she was just listening with so much empathy. And again, she started to feel this emotion and she brought back the four-year-old in me. It was unbelievable. Again, mimicking, powerful, paraphrasing, saying their words, their meaning, reflect uh, feeling. Uh, phase four is rephrase content and reflect feeling. And then five is say nothing just be with the person and they can sense it. You know, one of the things that was said at, a, at a, one of these Covey seminars, as we're watching some of the role playing, we'll get into role playing here in a second. Um, and some of these conversations seem so slow, so long, blah, 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 blah. And the, the thing we're gonna role play, I'm going to be Jamie, the new guy who's ready to quit, okay? That's, that's the part I'm going to play. Jamie, the new guy, and I just, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, they say in the, in, uh, at these seminars that empathic listening is the fastest form of communication. 
I remember that just stuck in my head years ago because I'm like, no, no, Stephen, this is the slowest form of communication. Like to really sit there to listen and let somebody get stuff off their chest or, or you know, try to feel what they're feeling. I'm like, there's nothing fast about this. And then over the years, again, this, this has been stuck in my head. I'm like, he's totally right. Because if it isn't done right the first time, you end up having the same conversation again later, and sometimes again later, and you've got this pro, you've got this long form of communication because you're just not hearing each other. You're not understanding what the other person's feeling. I'm like, wow, that, that's true. So if you're not listening so much because you're trying to be fast, just understand by not listening, you are engaging in the slowest form of communication on the planet. Interesting. Really interesting. So before we role play the, um, you know, one of the things I've kept over the years, anybody know what this is? Did I actually say it right there? It's a talking stick. It's like, what? Yeah, you spend some money and you go to these Covey seminars and, and one of the little gifts they give you when you study habit five is they give you this old, well, it's supposed to be, this is just a little trophy thing that would stand in my, it's in my office here. But he gets this from uh, an ancient Native American, I want to say it was Native American, but an, uh, a Native old tribe. They had a talking stick. They had a best practice almost like their judicial system, right? Like Tony Robbins on that Unleash the Power. You know, day one, you have to walk on fire, walk on burning coals. He got that from a Fijian tribal judicial system that they make the whole tribe walk on burning coals and whoever is the one that stole the goat in the village, he's the one that'll have burned feet. And he goes through the psychology of all this, right? It's like, whoa, interesting how, they, how he studied that. Well, Stephen Covey studies this talking stick that two people are having a conversation. I've got something to say. Let's just say this is how the, I mean, I wish I could see this in November um, when we see a bunch of debates with the politicians, right? I wish they would actually use a talking stick. It would actually make it a much more pleasant experience. So one would have to say, well, you know, here's what I'm thinking, here's what I'm feeling. And I'm talking and you cannot interrupt. Whoever holds the talking stick is the only person that can talk. You cannot interrupt if I'm holding this stick. I've tried this with my wife uh, early on as well too. And anytime we had conflict, I'm like, let's bust out this talking stick. Apparently this is supposed to work in every relationship. As much as you want to interrupt the person talking, you cannot. It's a, the rule. Before I pass it to you, you have to repeat everything, I, not everything, but you have to repeat the gist of what I just said. And if you get it wrong, no, you don't get the talking stick. Okay, Joanne, okay, so, so what I heard you say is, is you feel upset. No, that's not what I said. Okay, so what you're, what you're saying is you feel sad when, and I'd have to get it right. And then the person with the talking stick could be like, yes, yes. That is exactly what I said. And now you pass the talking stick on to that person. Okay, great. Now that I heard you clearly, and now that I can articulate what you just said, here's what I got to say. And before you can get the talking stick back, you've got to repeat what that person just said. It's a really interesting exercise. I mean, you guys can take a pen and do this talking stick exercise anytime there's conflict. Again, picture Trump and Biden on stage. All right, so Joe Biden, what you're trying to say is, no, Donald, that's not what I said. You can't talk yet. Okay, let me really listen to what you're saying. Okay, you want to create this policy, and the reason you want to do this policy is because of that. Yes, that's exactly what I said, Donald. Great, give me that talking stick. Here's what I got to say now. That's how debates should go. It's going to be long. <laughs> yes, that would be. But I'd be willing to watch because <laughs> there'd only be one debate. And we wouldn't have to watch 20 debates. It'd be one four hour long debate. So again, interesting exercise. I highly recommend 
the old ancient, I probably should have Googled it where it came from, which, which tribe it came from, but apparently this is hundreds of years old, this uh, tradition. You've got this big talking stick. I've got to say something. You cannot interrupt me. Let me get it off my chest. You have to repeat back to me what I said, how I feel. Yes, you got it. I passed the talking stick. All right. Role play. Uh, let's see. I got a chat box going on here. Uh, okay. Uh, you a high it was the uh, Akins Chiefs, by the way, Jamie. With the oh, there you go. Where are they from? What part of what region? Western. Um, uh, Western somewhere. What Western, like the United States area? I have to get back to that. Um, you find out. Oh, you don't. It doesn't matter. Yeah, Western Africa. Oh, Western Africa. Oh, huh. yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, I'm a high C. Anybody asking my disc profile, D I S C, I am a C type personality. D is second. So I need a volunteer, maybe just a hand. I just need a hand here of somebody that feels that you could diagnose me. You could listen to me. You could help me. I'm a newer person on your team. I've been working with you for a couple of weeks now. And you can see, I'll use again, Ken Blanchard language, you know, disc, I already used that, but he's D2. The diagnosis, that's the D, diagnosis two, low commitment and uh, low competence. And I'm probably going to turn over. I'm probably on my way out. I want somebody who can talk me through this uh, using your empathic listening to see if you can really help me out. All right. Roy, how you doing, Roy? I'm going to unmute you. Oh, thank you. You uh, ready for this, Roy? Where, where are you yeah, at, Roy? Where? No, but uh, I'm going to give it a shot anyways. But where are you? Oh, I'm in Toronto right now, but I'm in the Newfoundland office. Ah, you're in Toronto right now and you work in Newfoundland. Yes. 30 minutes faster than Eastern Standard Time. Yeah, sometimes 30, sometimes an hour 30. Really depends on how the clock works. Yeah, gotcha. All right, so you know the scenario, and uh, let's role play. Well, give it a shot. All right, so uh, listen, Roy. I, I, I don't know if this is for me. Oh. Sorry, did I freeze, or... <laughs> no, Maybe sorry. I I'm sorry. I don't know. If yeah, you heard me. I, I just froze for a second. Uh, okay. Can, can you can you do that again? My apologies. Sure. I just have a real quick statement here to make. You know, I'm really questioning if I'm in the right business. I, I just don't know if this is for me. Mm. So, uh, Jamie, um, what do you mean by this is not for you? Well, I, I just don't know if this is the right model for me. I don't know if I'm in the right place. Oh, right. So, so you don't know if you're in the right place. Um, I, I'm a little curious, Jamie, what would, uh, what would a right place look like for you, Jamie? Well, yeah, good question. Uh, um, yeah, something that's, uh, I don't know, something just with a little more structure, maybe something that's a little more nine to five, something with a, you know, something with security. Right. So, so from your perspective, Jamie, you would say that structure and a, and a well-developed schedule is something that's very important to you, right? Yeah, well, maybe, maybe I didn't even wear to write. I mean, just something with some, something with just some stability and security. Stability and security. Mm. So in terms of stability, what do you mean by that? Do you mean like a financial st stability or do you mean like what, what type of stability are you looking for, Jamie? Yeah, like the, the same steady pay every week would be stability and just something that's like the same work every week, like mm. not as challenging. Right. It's it seems like every, every day, every door, it's just, it's just so different and it's hard. Um, so, yeah, just something easier. Mm. So something easier. Now, in, in your mind, uh, what, what would something easier look like, Jamie? Well, maybe something I don't have to walk around all the time. Oh, okay. So, so walking around is, is a little bit difficult, right? Um, 
Well, no, I mean, I can, I can walk. I mean, I'm an athlete. So, I mean, I, you know, I can, I can walk and everything like that. It's just. Oh, nice. We never really connected on this. What sport did you play again? I played basketball. No way. What position? Uh, shooting guard. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So I was, I was a, I was a small forward until I sprained my ankle uh, a while ago. It was, it was quite difficult. Um, yeah, Jamie, I, I can definitely relate. I, well, I, I can try to relate to what you're, what you're feeling in the sense that I, I recall back when I was first starting, uh, um, my leader in the sense that he, he, he just told me to keep up. And I, I was originally from an engineering background as did I, did I have a chance to tell you by any chance? Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. Sorry. I just wasn't sure. Um, so I was from an engineering background and being so used to sitting at a nine to five and when they shift me to walking for four or five hours straight, Oh man, you couldn't believe it. After the first Sunday, I couldn't move at all. Would you would you say is that similar to how you feel? I I'm trying to I'm trying to get understanding. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean you guys just have such big lofty goals and you guys want to do such big things with your life. I mean, I I don't I don't really feel I'm that ambitious. Hmm. So so uh, you feel like you're a little bit threatened by the ambition displayed by the people around you? Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I don't really feel like I really would deserve that kind of life that you guys keep talking about. I mean, mm. I was always a C student. I never did well in school. I've never, you know, I've never been thought of to do big things with my life. I just want to be happy and have some security. Nice. So, so Jamie, I, 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 I kind of have to ask a little follow-up question. I'm, I'm a little curious to you, what you do want to be happy in life. So what does happiness look like for you? I don't have a clue. Oh, good. That makes two of us. <laughs> <laughs> All I right. Think so, so I want to pause right. Everybody give a, give a high five and applause here. I mean, that was great. That was really good. I mean, I have it written down here, right? I have it written down the scenario and I'm like, can you get me to open up? You know, can you get me there? And, um, you know, some of the key words you guys may have heard, you know, hey, I'm curious. I love that. And I'm curious. I mean, I, 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 I say this to my kids. I mean, just healthy curiosity is the motor of learning. Like, just be curious with everything. Like, just be curious. Again, synergy. We'll talk about that next week, synergy. But if somebody, again, I, I recommend this to any of you that think that you're liberal, any of you that think you're conservative and you're like, uh, I make an argument all the time saying that everybody's purple. Everybody's purple. If you're willing to listen, right, but have a healthy dose of curiosity. I mean, somebody as smart as you, I mean, I mean, there's got to be something I'm missing. There's got to be something I'm missing. So I love that you're curious. You asked me how I felt. You could see how the conversation evolved. It went, you know, again, you even called me out on like the walking. So, so walking is, well, no, walking is not, it's not walking. And really, when you keep peeling the onion, we use that term a lot in our business, you know, you got to peel the onion, you got to get to the core. You know, the, the role playing I wanted to do here is just, I don't know, I just wasn't raised with a lot of ambition. I wasn't raised thinking I would add up to much, which is sad. I mean, that's such a sad thing. But we've all come across people like that. In fact, you know, I think that probably describes me a little bit. I mean, I wasn't the C student, but I never pictured myself having this crazy successful life i thought i you know i just expected much i had lower expectations of what my life was going to look like so it's interesting again it you know empathy and really listening is oxygen to that other individual so i thought you did a really good job there so good stuff uh, i'm just going to kind of you know leave on this note again i promise you guys this would be less than 90 minutes um, 
I don't think I've got really 90 minutes of material. Had four good videos, had a great role model there with Roy, so I totally appreciate that. Um, I, I just, I, I go through times in my life, like I remember, I remember a time being so frustrated as a leader, just not being able to build a team. I remember one time going into the owner's office and just unloading, just venting. And I didn't have direction on where I was going and I didn't have any questions. I was just vomiting. And I just remember after all that vomiting, I was asked like, hey, you wanna go for a beer? You know, yes. I felt like that girl with the nail in her head. Like I, I wasn't really looking for anything. I just needed to get this off my chest. I just needed to imagine if I would have been met with, hey, hey, what's your question? I don't have time for this. Hey, listen, we all go through this stuff. Hey, listen, hey, when I was a, a rep in, in, the off, in the field, th this is what I did. So, you know, just do some of this. Okay, got it? Anything else you need from me? Uh, no, I'm all good. Like imagine how that may have turned out. So, yeah, just the, again, empathic listening, that is the key to be able to feel what people are, are, are feeling, to be able to really connect with that person. Um, one of the movies that I watched uh, a couple years ago that I fell in love with, great kid, kids movie, it's a Pixar movie, Inside Out, okay? One of my top 10 movies of all time. I mean, I love that movie. And so a lot of times, even with my kids, again, we go through the the five basic emotions, right? Anger, joy, fear, disgust. Who am I missing? Anger, joy, fear, oh, and sadness. <laughs> that good old sadness, the blue, the blue girl. You know, and, and so interesting frame of reference for my kids, like, are you feeling, are you feeling sad? And like just talking through that sadness and just connecting and just, I don't know, there's something really cool that happens with those bonds when there's empathic listening happening and obviously you know this is key you know in the world of team building again raise your eq and you're raising your leadership lid work on your eq work on empathic listening that is a big component of a great emotional quotient um i'm going to give you guys a homework assignment uh the homework assignment is you're going to work on your empathic listening. I mean, you're all doing Zoom calls like crazy. You're all probably connecting with your family more than you have. I mean, I don't know. It seems like, I could be wrong, but it seems like people are more emotionally connected than they've been in a while because maybe we've got time for it where before we, we were maybe too busy. I, I don't know. But try that on for size. Try, try the talking stick. Try doing what Roy did. Hey, I'm curious why you feel the way you do. With the intent to really listen, not the intent to reply. Okay, so that, that's one of the homework assignments. Again, a little easier than, uh, you know, habit two, begin with the end in mind when I made you write down all your, your mission statements, your values. Okay, the course got easier here, but, but work on it. It's a skill that, again, when I went through this course, it was out of, my se out of the seven habits, it was my weakest grade by far. And so I've had to put, you know, a lot of work into it. And the good news is you can build these muscles. You can do it. You can do it. Roy did. And the uh, second part of your homework assignment is read habit six. So we've only got two more lessons to go. I hope you guys are enjoying the seven habits. It's great seeing all you guys. Have yourselves a great day. And I'll talk to you guys all soon. Same time next week. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Jamie.